So now what I'm going to talk about is some environmental effects that we all know. Modules get hot in the sun, they lose voltage, da, 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 yada, yada. How come? Okay, that's what we're going to look at here. And now we're going to be able to answer it from a physics point of view correctly. Now let's start looking at some stuff that we think is familiar. So IV curves are affected by their environment. One of those effects is the irradiance or the amount of sunlight shining on the cell or the module or the array. And we show that typically this way. With less light shining, the IV curve has less height. With less light, we have less current, okay? That's something that we should all know. And because the output of the module is affected by light, the industry has come up with a standard that's a thousand watts per square meter of irradiance in order to measure the modules. In real life, it'll probably get less than that or more, but for a manufacturer to measure its modules, we need a standard around the world and we've settled on this. And it's really weird because the 1000 isn't arbitrary. If you measure like at the equator, at sea level, under a certain defined clarity of sky um, at you know, noon, you get like 1,002 or something like that. It's crazy. So it was rounded to 1,000. It's actually measured. Out in space, it's like 1,350. But by the time it goes through the atmosphere, it goes down to 1,000. It's really pretty crazy that it's actually 1,000. OK, so that's the standard. But whenever we draw these curves, there's always this change. And in fact, it drives me crazy when we have curves drawn and they all come to the same point. They don't. But OK, brilliant people, why does the voltage change and why doesn't it go down like light? If I get half as much light, how come I don't get half as much voltage? How come? Well, now we're going to be able to understand this. So let's take a look. So remember the whole situation we've got. We've got photogenerated current. So that's electrons that are now free to move in the conduction band, and they can flow. And at, we're talking about open circuit voltage here. Remember, open circuit voltage? That's where there's enough, well, there's nowhere to go. So the buildup of electrons is so much that this population of high enough energy electrons can flow backwards through the diode and the two currents equal each other, okay? So this condition results in zero current, right? Zero current, maximum voltage. VOC occurs when the diode current going backwards equals the photo current going forward right? And that creates and defines what we call the VOC at that point. Let's say under 1,000 watts of light. Now, let's reduce the amount of light. So let's look at the red curve, right? So what's going on? We have less photocurrent in this case. Everything before, I always kept the photocurrent the same. But now, I'm changing the amount of photocurrent. I'm reducing it a lot. So if I have a less electrons flowing this way, I'm going to need less electrons flowing back in order to make the total zero, right? So if my photo current is smaller, so then the reverse current can be smaller to result in the two currents being equal, right? So the piling up of electrons and the resulting elevation of this final voltage can be less in order for the condition to be that I get enough electrons flowing backwards. Now watch what happens. So basically, my, my elevation level can be lower. I can be at a lower voltage state with less electrons piled up so that I have enough electrons with enough energy that flow the other way and these two become equal. So if my final voltage elevation needed to be less, the, the difference between where I started and where I ended up is smaller. And so that's why the voltage goes down. The buildup of current that you now understand that goes on inside can be less so that the internal current is zero. And if that buildup is less, it means that the resulting difference between the two, where I started and where I end, is less. That's what results in voltage going down. Let's keep looking at stuff here. What's the effect of temperature? Ah, this is pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so now we know that as a module or a cell heats up, we lose voltage 
as the cell gets hotter. And because of that, the temperature of the cell is important. And we've all internationally agreed on a standard of 25 degrees centigrade, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's, that could have been anything. It could be 30, it could be zero, whatever. We chose 25, as most things are defined at 25. A lot are defined in Europe at 20, but just choosing it because that's kind of room temperature. So we're gonna run machinery and stuff. Why not measure stuff at room temperature? That's all. But it's been established as that temperature. But when you take a module and put it out in the sun, it's gonna get hot and it's gonna lose voltage. Why? Why does it lose the voltage? How come this happens? Okay, so now let's keep going. Again, we're gonna look at it from this point of view. Now this would be our standard picture, right? Remember, this is, let's say 1.1 electron volt difference between being a bound electron and being a conduction electron. And the difference between, and again, I'm talking about open circuit voltage now, right? So if I knock an electron loose, it rolls down the hill, they're piled up here. The difference between where I started and where I end is the voltage potential that I have available to you. That gives me my VOC. But now, what if I get hot? Okay. Now, consider this. The whole cell, let's say a single solar cell, is getting hot. All the electrons are bouncing around. They're starting to move faster. The, the electron, the silicon electron, the silicon atoms are vibrating. The electrons are moving around more with more energy. They've got more kinetic thermal energy. Everything's got more energy to begin with. So it turns out that the baseline energy level is higher. The place where I start from is at a higher energy level. I don't need as much energy to become free because I'm already agitated more than I was before. You know, I'm a bound electron, but I'm kind of jiggling and I'm ready to go. And you don't need to push me as hard in order to break me free because I've already got more energy because of the thermal effect. So I've shrunk my band a little bit. But what does that mean? That means that when light comes in and knocks an electron loose from here up to here, it gained less energy. So it has less energy to give back. So that's why when the cells get hot, you have less voltage overall. Because remember, the voltage was the difference of what you started with and what you ended up with. And if you started at a higher level, you didn't have to rise as far, so you don't have as far to drop down. You don't have as much to give back. The cells themselves have less voltage. The electrons have less voltage to give back because they got lit, uh, less to begin with. And that's why solar cells lose voltage. So the VOC is smaller. It's because their internal voltage, their internal energy level is higher to begin with. They gain less from their light, so they have less to give back. Now, I'm gonna finish up with one more talk, and this is gonna start talking about different colors of light and different energies. And this is pretty cool, because this has to do with tandem solar cells and stuff like that. What's the effect of a spectrum? We don't think about this much, because we can't control this. We can measure the light level, we can measure the temperature, but you, nobody measures the spectrum, okay? But solar cell manufacturers do, and they have to, for exactly what I'm gonna tell you about now. So this gray curve right here, if you can see this, this gray curve is the curve that's called air mass zero. It's the curve of the distribution of light that we get from the sun. Our particular sun, other suns maybe with different materials would be different, but roughly it's this, right? So this is the wavelength, and this happens to show the visible region, but there's ultraviolet here, and there's lots of infrared over here that we get from the sun. Now, this curve represents what's out in space, air mass zero, outside of any air mass of the atmosphere. Once it goes through the atmosphere and gets filtered by aerosols and moisture and stuff like that, it drops down a little bit. It's got some gaps here where it's absorbed by water. And you get this, this distribution of light coming onto our solar cells on the Earth. Manufacturers have to simulate the light that they shine on their modules in order to measure their output, right? They better get that light right. So it has been established just like 25 degrees and 1,000 watts. The spectrum of light, the amount of blue, greens, yellows, orange, and reds, has been specified into a distribution curve that is based on being, going through the air at one and a half thicknesses. 
one and a half atmospheres of thickness. The idea is that at noon, the sun shining straight down on you goes through basically one thickness of atmosphere. That would be air mass one, one mass of typical thickness. I don't know, 30, 40 miles of, of atmosphere. But in the morning, the sun is rising. It's going through more, right? Because it's coming at an angle. And then at night or in the afternoon, it's going through more atmosphere because it's going at an angle. So early on, the industry established this distance and this angle where the module surface was tilted at 37 degrees and the sun angle was at 48 degrees, which basically defined going through one and a half thicknesses of atmosphere. And that was chosen to be kind of an average average, right? You can choose anything, so let's choose something that's kind of reasonable and gets us going. And by going through one and a half atmospheres, you can define the exact profile of light that your solar simulator had better try to simulate. So that's the definition of air mass 1.5. And the G stands for global, as opposed to direct or diffuse. Where direct would be from the circle of the sun and diffuse would be from the blue of the sky. Global is all of that added together. So going through one and a half thicknesses of atmosphere, global, catching it all together. That's what defines it. So it's kind of going backwards. It's defining the this, this spectrum based on the thickness of atmosphere that it's going through. But let's take this further. Let's look at how silicon responds to light. So this is critical to understanding, you know, the blues and greens coming in and that idea of excess energy and stuff. So I'm going to talk about this now. So this graph is the graph of what's called the spectral response of silicon. And you can look that up. Look up spectral response. And you can get different spectral responses for different stuff, like copper and diselenide or gallium arsenide or, you know, or amorphous silicon. All these different cells have different spectral responses. Think of it being like the response of your eyeball, right, to light. This, this spectrum over here basically shows you where our eyeball responds to light. This graph shows you where silicon responds to light. But notice, it starts here, just begins here, at roughly 1,200, roughly 1,200 uh, nanometers of, of wavelength. That corresponds to 1.1 volts of light, of, of energy in that light. And as we get shorter wavelengths, we get higher frequencies, more energy. So the response of the cell rises up to a peak, but then it starts to drop off. And notice that here in the, in the near infrared, we get a high response. And down here in the violet, we get almost half as much. Why is that? Why isn't light coming in? Well, this is measuring amps out versus watts of energy in, not the number of photons in, but the energy that those photons bring. And the point is here, these guys are bringing in just roughly 1.1 electron volts. All of that wattage that's in that little photon is being used. Whereas these guys, I'm gonna talk about this more, all of these guys have more than 1.1 electron volts worth of energy. They have that excess that gets lost. And so if I measure the amount of current out compared to the amount of energy that it brought in, this violet light knocks electrons loose, but I'm not able to use all the energy that it brought because some of it gets lost as heat. So the energy that I get out of uh, with electrons from that light is half the energy that I get from red light. I'm going to keep going and show you that in a different way right here. So all light is not equal. And this is a little bit of physics to finish everything off. If I look at a photon of, let's say, violet or ultraviolet light, it might look like that. If I look at a photon of red, or actually think of the red going into infrared, we can't see it, but look, think of this as being infrared light, it looks like this. And the two wavelengths are not the same, right? So the red photon has double the wavelength of violet, right? Think of this as infrared and ultraviolet. So it's got double the wavelength. And referring to some physics, turns out that the frequency of light times the wavelength of the light is always equal to the speed of light. <laughs> it's like, you know, the distance that you go in one cycle times the number of cycles gives you the speed that you go at light. And I can rewrite this so that frequency is equal to C over lambda. The point here 
is that the frequency and the wavelength are inversely related. If I increase my wavelength, I decrease my frequency. If I decrease my wavelength, I increase my frequency, okay? Now, so the red photon has half the frequency of the violet, right? And now some more physics turns out from our friend Max Planck that the energy of a photon is equal to h times the frequency, h times nu. h is just a number, it's just a, it's just a constant. So the point is that the energy is proportional to the frequency. Higher frequency light, more energy in that light, in that photon. Lower frequency, lower energy. So that's why we think of ultraviolet, high frequency light, being very energetic, it can go into your skin, cause cancer, stuff like that. So if the red photon has half the frequency, the red photon has half the energy of the violet. So photon to photon, they don't carry the same amount of energy. So it turns out that you need double the number of red photons to deliver the same irradiance, the same watts, as you would from the number of violet photons. And let's put this into practice. A solar simulator in one part of the world that's delivering a thousand watts doing its job, but of mostly red light, would have double the photons and therefore double the current of a simulator that delivered a thousand watts, but of violet light. So you can have two simulators that are calibrated at a thousand watts. Oh, okay, they're good, thousand watts, that's what we're supposed to do. But if it's mostly red and mostly violet, they will produce different results. And you can't have that. You've got to have simulators that produce the same result if you take a module from one simulator to another. So we got to get this right. So solar simulator manufacturers spend a lot of time filtering their light so that they can match that spectrum of the air mass 1.5 pretty carefully. So that if you take a module from one simulator with one output and you put it in another simulator somewhere else, you get the same output. They have to be concerned about that. We don't do that in our daily lives, but that's why you need all three conditions to make your standard test condition, your STC. It's always listed here, STC, you get your output numbers. What are they based on? 1,000 watts per square meter, 25 degrees C cell temperature, and air mass 1.5. That's why that guy's there, because the manufacturer that made this spec had to do it by obeying the light balancing of air mass 1.5 so that you can compare apples to apples. So we put them all together, and this is what fully defines STC conditions, including all these conditions which we now understand we have to know because of the physics underneath. 